Mr. Barnes, how goes the battle, sir? Good, good. This is how I create through depth perception, the illusion that I am I am a monster compared to you. Robert is a full foot taller than me. Uh, but if I stand closer to the camera, I am. I am the bigger person. Robert, what's new? First of all, before we get there, uh, book behind you, uh, Unlit Cigar in Your Mouth. What are they? Sure. Uh, Creation of American Republic by uh, uh, Gordon Wood. Uh, some people on our locals board will like the reference to Republic in particular. So that was partially an ode to them. I do, in fact, read every single post. Somebody challenged that by putting up a post saying I don't read the post and I liked and responded to it. The uh, uh, the in fact, I, I read the only thing I'm guaranteed to read each day compared to DMs and emails from various members of the public uh, is uh, is at the board. If you want to actually reach me, that's that's the way. Because uh, I do uh, read all of the uh, comments and posts and uh, and any replies to to anything I post as well. So the it's been interesting. I mean, it's been an interesting week. There were some uh, the people that have a uh, uh, the more the institutional narrative, the Western narrative on the Ukrainian conflict that was predicting that uh, China was going to rebuff Russia and join the effort of sanctions when they talked with Biden on Friday. Not exactly what happened. Uh, instead, uh, President Z used an old uh, uh, an old Chinese proverb that said, uh, he who ties the bell around the tiger must be the one to untie it. And the uh, and then NATO decided to be critical of uh, China, China's position on this as well. And they China, China responded by reminding them that they bombed their embassy in Belgrade in 1999. So so a lot of the predictions, uh, uh, that's funny, real bambuga. Uh, the, a lot of the predictions by the West have not come to fruition. The, the amount... Uh, of misinformation out there is is hitting i mean even for wartime is really hitting new highs because of the way social media can help uh uh inflate the misinformation that is wide and far apart i was reading a conservative lawyer who was explaining that because uh she speaks russian she knows better than everyone else and then she went and repeated like every mythology that exists from the, the State Department, the George Soros establishment types that is out there. It's like, well, apparently she hasn't spent much time actually using those Russian language skills uh, to study any of the Russian history or listen to actually Russian speakers and whatnot to at least understand what their position is rather than the mythical one. But, yeah, I but I, Zelensky has been nominated for a, a Nobel Peace Prize, just like Barack Obama, who right, right soon thereafter led us into multiple uh, military conflicts, wars, <laughs> more violence around the world. Uh, so it, it fits in that tradition. And not long after he was and David Frum was promoting him is it's amazing how Ukraine is becoming even more liberal and tolerant during a war. Uh, the next day, he banned all the opposition parties and uh, banned other than the neo-Nazi parties. Those were not banned. Th those are still allowed. But the uh, uh, banned everybody else, banned the media. There's only going to be one centralized media platform now and started arrest arresting random bloggers and journalists who are, who are just into who if you voice any. Uh, independent opinion whatsoever, uh, you're, you you now can end up in a Ukrainian jail. And Robert, uh, you know, you, so you you put me onto Coach Red Pill, as did ever you know a lot of people in the chat. Is I mean I, I don't know if I want to ask you this, but is he in Ukraine and is he among the you know the dissident bloggers or journalists who who might be in trouble? Well, he'd been previously targeted. He's now in a uh, secreted lo uh, location. Uh, inside, uh, my understanding is, I think, Kharkov, uh, spelled K-H-A-R-K-O-V. Uh, the, if I mispronunciated it, you know, same as my English. We're going to have uh, a shirt that says mispronunciation. Mi pronunciation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> no doubt. The, uh, but, uh, uh, so, and he went into that location after, I mean, he just voiced very, he didn't really voice even heavy criticism. He appeared on the Duran and just made some points that the the propaganda about what was happening in the war just didn't appear to be accurate that the uh, that there wasn't this you know massive russian desertion and failure nor was there this massive ukrainian success uh that you know somewhere in between and that the ukrainian uh you know had not been reliable in terms of the information they were provided of course we got to witness that in live time you know the ghost of kiev the snake island rebellion you know one one mythology after the next after the next uh and the uh after that uh he found out people had come to his home that were associated with some of the more roguish elements of the Zelensky regime looking for him uh luckily his wife and his kids and uh, he were not there 
Uh, but given the stories he has heard, in fact, many of these people actually brag on their TikTok accounts and Telegram accounts of the various torture the Ukrainian regime uh, type militia types engage in, particularly connected to the Azov Battalion in the that's that's heavily dominant in the east, though they come overwhelmingly from the far west, which has uh, a, lo- a history of Nazi collusion and things like that. I'll do a separate hush hush on the unique history of that region of Ukraine. The uh, it, at vivabarnslaw.locals.com uh, this week. But so he was able, and I think that inspired him to be more outspoken once he found himself in a place where he could be protected uh, or his disc- his location undisclosed. Uh, he's been very aggressive and assertive at detailing all the things he understands. Uh, Gonzalo Lira, he has a personal channel plus the Coach Red Pill channel um, the that on YouTube, and he just gives his opinion. You can take it, you know, however you want to. But he's an American in Ukraine that's lived there for a while, who's seen all sides of it. And he's seen the worst of this Zelensky regime in particular. The, the people promoting the, him are going to regret it in time. It's only a matter of time. Because uh, to be promoted as a democratic hero in the next day, ban press, ban journalists, ban parties, you know, right, well, but, okay, tells you but, who he is. Tr- tr- Trudeau, I mean, I- except on a degree of scales. I mean, Ukraine reminds you of the Spanish Civil War. Both sides loathes, loathes them in the extreme. You know, Trudeau, except by degree, did the same thing in Canada. You know, just yes. go after your political adversaries, lock up political prisoners, you know, the people who speak out, find a way to do it under the law, invoke the Emergencies Act, bring in the militarized police force, and just shut it all down. Now, they happen to be in an actual bona fide state of emergency in Ukraine. There's no question about that. Uh, but what do you get to do under those measures? I mean, we'll, we'll get into what he's doing in a second. But Robert, so, and I, I appreciate people don't like Coach Red Pill. Nobody likes people who seemingly make make a living doing work to bring what they perceive to be the truth to the people. It's like people just think they're entitled to people risking their lives for free, providing information for free, providing content for free. And if they dare make money while doing it, they're somehow, you know, corrupt or whatever. They're grifters. I, I can see people thinking that, but I've, I've listened to Coach Red Pill. He's certainly opinionated. Um, but you take the information in, you compare it to the other information you're getting elsewhere, and you come to your own conclusions. One story, Robert, we talked about, uh, it was two weeks ago now, it was uh, Renault, the journalist, ex-former New York Times, who was killed in Irpin. And at the time, the New York Times had reported that the headline said, you know, killed by Russian forces, but the actual video article, the journalist in the video, nine minute, 10 minute video said, it's not clear who did it. When we discussed it, we were discussing the fact that it was in an area controlled by Ukrainian forces. Since then, I've just been trying to find an update that's a meaningful update, but every single article says killed by Russian forces as confirmed by Ukrainian forces. Do you have any additional information? Have you heard any news on that particular event that might you know, bring some conclusion as to who, who pulled the trigger? Yeah, Jordan Schachtel, who's been previously writes for the, he writes a Substack column called the dossier he's previously been on our sidebars he's been following this he's followed national security for many years worked in dc for a period of time uh it, you know no one would accuse him of being a putin ally the uh he has said it's most likely the ukraine ukrainians and this has happened throughout i mean they they, they uh, claim that the russians had bombed a theater in maripol and it the better evidence is that uh it was uh, an action by the ukrainian sort of crazies that are there. The, the hardcore Azov battalion, the most hardcore neo-Nazi aligned individuals were the were the people that uh, the Ukrainians sent to that part of uh, dissident separatist Ukraine. Uh, they, you know, And there's been a range of the a military affairs channel that does a YouTube analysis, very neutral, has no political bone in the fight whatsoever, has been documenting on almost daily basis the various false flags and false media reports about what's happening whether it's false claims of uh, the Russians mining uh, humanitarian corridors to blow them up or, you know, try try to deliberately attack civilians. Uh, there was a, a British journalist was in one of the towns that Russia had come through and uh, as they went on their march. And it was a town that has uh, local political leadership that's hostile to Russia. So they didn't want any humanitarian assistance. They said, fine, they moved on. He just documents it walking all the way through the street. So the uh, uh, the these. In fact, what Scott Ritter said, Scott Ritter is one of the most uh, foremost uh, uh, war uh, studiers because going all the way back to the Iraqi war, he was the guy warning that there weren't weapons of mass destruction there. Uh, that's what put him sort of on the international stage. He has said probably when it's all said and done, 
we'll find out that Russia abided more by the laws of war uh, than most other nations have in recent wars, including the Americans for sure, and that the Ukrainians will have been some of the most atrocious violators. Uh, and I, I suspect that's going to be true when it's all said and done, to, to the degree we ever get to the truth. Yeah, well, that, 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 that's that's a big if. Now, core ores. I don't think this is a trollish comment. Says they have bombed civilians' barns. Now, Robert, I, I so nobody takes you out of context or says things that you don't say. There's no question. We can agree on the fact that innocent civilians have been killed by Russian action in in Ukraine. We can agree on that. Oh yeah. I mean, there's no. What I would do is I would compare it by the norm. So about the Russians have taken more casualties uh, because they've chosen not to engage in the kind of bombing strategies that the West has done in almost every war since and including World War II, um, which was deliberate mass bombing of civilian locations, which conveniently there's been a lot of amnesia uh, in the West about. The, uh, and that's the problem with saying they're targeting civilians. If they were targeting civilians, they would just bomb. They don't lack the missiles. They don't lack the bombs. They showed off that the hypo, hypersonic a uh, missile that the many, some military officials in the West, uh, more on the intelligence side, not the military really, had said didn't exist, uh, they actually used uh, and showed off this week uh, in hitting various uh, uh, munition depots and places where foreign mercenaries and Ukrainian army were stationed. Um, but if they wanted to mass bomb civilians, they would mass bomb civilians. Uh, you know, that hasn't happened. Indeed, there's been very little uh, air bombing, very little bombing of any civilian related location compared to a typical war. But you're definitely always going to have civilian casualties. But the civilian casualty ratio so far uh, is substantially less than what it was when the civilian casualties in Iraq when we went in. So the it's inevitable. One reason why I'm an inst innate critic of war is that innocent civilians are guaranteed to die. Uh, but the, there isn't really evidence of deliberate targeting of civilians. And the best evidence against that is if they wanted to do so, they would do so. And they would gain a substantial military advantage by doing so. They've gone out of their way not to do so. That's, that's the problem those people can't explain. Uh, so they have to come up with contradictory narratives. And one way you can you know, discover a contradictory narrative is if, is if they tell you someone is an incompetent buffoon and an evil genius at the same time, they're probably lying to you because the two don't go together. Fair point. Now, I'm gonna, I want to bring this one up. Barnes, you say you talk about the Yahtzees in the Ukraine. Why don't you talk about the Yahtzees in Putin's orbit? Wagner Group has Yahtzee ties, Russian imperialist movement, etc. So they're referencing the mercenary organization that's kind of like some of the mercenary organizations we have here in the United States and that are common throughout the world and the uh, and those aspects. But the, the problem with that uh, attempt at that now is that it ignores the deeper history of the Ukrainian conflict, from the, particularly from the Russian mindset. And that I'll get into that in the hush hush about the unique history of the far west of Ukraine and that that informs a lot of it. Your, your ordinary Ukrainian is not pro-Nazi at all. It's a very small component that's grown extraordinarily influential. Uh, thanks, frankly, to some uh, three letter agencies here in the United States over the past decade. See the, the thing, and Robert, you'll you'll tell me if they're not analogous. But when 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 every flare up occurs between Israel and 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 Palestine, Gaza Strip, or the West Bank, Israel comes in. You know, they, they go in on the ground. They don't indiscriminately bomb. There's always the same accusations that they're targeting civilians. They blew up a school. They blew up a hospital. Then there's always the counter argument or the counter position that they say that people are you know military is hiding among these these uh, Hamas targets. Hamas, yeah, so Hamas is hi hiding among these schools so that it happens and this is the fog of war now i i I'm, call it a uh prejudgment or what my own my own preconceived notions i would tend to think that israel fights a more moral war than russia would just because of geopolitics maybe i'm wrong but maybe i'm not uh but like anybody to say yeah nobody's nobody's denying that innocent ukrainians are being killed in this in this incursion this invasion by russia mm -hmm. the question is is Russia guilty? Is that being true? Is Russia guilty of what they are now referring to as war crimes, which is deliberate targeting of civilians or indiscriminate bombing, which you necessarily know will invariable, invariably uh, cause civilian casualties? And that's the question, which will we ever get an answer to it? Or we'll, we'll, we'll never get the full evidence. But so far, there's I agree with Scott Ritter that there's uh, very little. There's been great lengths. I mean, as Colonel McGregor has been, uh, he did an interview on the Gray Zone, of course, that was really uh, uh, in, insightful with uh, 
Aaron Mate and Max Blumenthal, they come from the anti-war left. Um, the, uh, but as he explained and he explained on Fox news with Tucker Carlson, uh, Russia's going in soft and they're, they're doing, and there may be other geopolitical reasons. And it was, I would, you, you could claim, you could fairly argue that, uh, in this particular conflict, Russia has a unique motivation that's even stronger than the Israeli motivation geopolitically to avoid civilian casualties as much as possible even at the expense of military success uh, or the quickness of that success, and even at the expense of Russian military lives. And so the, uh, uh, and there's been a lot more evidence that, you, I mean, Ukraine has already used cluster bombs on a civilian location in Donetsk just this week. And, you know, they, they killed over 13,000 kids, women, and, and men in uh, the Donbass over the past eight years. So the, the, let me stop you know. there. People are going to say, Barnes, you're spouting off Putin talking points. Uh, as far as I understand it, these are not these are not uh, disputable figures. I thought it was fourteen thousand since two thousand fourteen, mm -hmm. which 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 the argument goes, and I'll I'll spout off the Zelensky talking points that Ukraine are fighting uh, Russian loyalist separatist violent mercenaries who are trying to violently uh, bring about independence in the Donbass Donetsk region, which ninety plus percent didn't vote to join Russia, but voted to become independent states and who are by and large uh, Russian loyalists. So they're going to say they're all, they're all, they're all, you know, violent separatist loyalists who are wreaking havoc and we're entitled to bomb them. You know, in as much as people are going to believe that what you're saying is the truth, what is the best information on those 13, 14,000 people who have been killed in the last eight years? So the, uh, I mean, the, the two regions, this all happened after the Maidan coup of 2014, where the elected president of Ukraine had to flee because of an insurrection in Kiev, uh, an insurrection that <clears throat> is well documented in the film uh, Ukraine on Fire, which is freely available on Rumble. And, the, uh, and th that's where you can get the best sort of full history of what took place there. There's also French documentary films, uh, other documentary films about the Donbass in particular. And the two things that have uh, what happened in the is after the Maidan coup, there was a, you know, what you would expect. A lot of people who were opposed that coup, who had supported that president, uh, rebelled and they rebelled in different ways. Uh, different areas declared independence. Different areas had mass protests. The reaction of the Ukrainian regime was to unleash the neo-Nazi militias on those regions. Uh, and they notoriously burned civilians alive in Odessa that were protesters, uh, you know, went into Kharkov in a brutal manner and in other regions throughout Ukraine in a brutal manner. And the reason why they used the neo-Nazi militias is they would be the most vicious. And so the even if they didn't politically align with those groups, uh, they became a useful tool. And uh, the two regions of Donetsk uh, and uh, or the Donbass region, uh, the two independent, they decided to declare their independence and they had a referendum overwhelmingly voted for that. Not a surprise. Those regions were 90 plus percent for the candidate that just got deposed. Uh, and then the Ukrainian army decided, no, we don't accept that and decided to wage war on them. And then they responded. Now, after the Ukrainian army waged war on them, Russia provided uh, armed support and other support to them. Uh, but they, the army itself didn't go in and those are all, all natives and, you know, anybody there's, there's a reporter, there's an American reporter kind of stumbled in there who's now lived there for eight years. Uh, Patrick, who continues to report from the region. Um, he was a art photographer, just traveling Europe, photographing, you know, trying to do art photography, saw some protest in Greece and thought that would be interesting. Uh, this was, you know, back during the whole Greece IMF, uh, you know, EU kind of debacle over their debt. Uh, went down and realized that the Western press was not printing, was not reporting accurately what was happening. He thought this might be a journalistic opportunity, uh, photojournalistic in particular, but otherwise. Uh, then as after that died down, he thought, well, that was interesting. And he saw the, the Crimea dispute happen. And what he'd heard from the West was, uh, you know, Crimea has been annexed by Putin, who's come in and invaded the country and de declared it part of his own. So he's like, I want to see if that's what's happening and what do people think? And then he gets there and he realizes all the Western media reports were completely false. And this is a guy that came into this with no politics whatsoever. I mean, you can listen to the guy. You can tell he's not you know, overtly political by nature. The, uh, so he's not like a lefty reporter or an anti-war reporter or pro-Putin, you know, whatever. They uh, just went in there independently and found out that, of course, 
Crimeans overwhelmingly wanted, uh, didn't want to be part of this coup government in Ukraine and wanted to return to Russia where much of their population had been born into Russia. Uh, and, and so then the Donbass happened. And so he went up to the Donbass to report what was happening there and has been there for eight years. And you can go to his videos. He just reports what's happening the best he can. Just an ordinary everyday guy, uh, independent journalist. And he's detailed the horrors that have taken place. And that the he attributes most of the horrors to the Ukrainian uh, army, particularly the controversial part is the what the Ukraine chose to do was unleash their neo-Nazi units. They incorporated them into the National Guard, incorporated them into the military units there. So they put the worst possible people to be uh, in charge of disciplining the separatist regions. And, you know, you can almost guarantee they'll commit. Again, these people actually are still to this day, you know, taping. They're, the horrors, the torture they're doing to people because they broadcast it and like it on their TikToks and well, Telegrams and elsewhere. And, and, and we people have put it together, what, what's taking place. There was a video of a UFC fighter who apparently had been kidnapped and was being um, you know, tortured. I mean, I don't know what the other word is, but it, but it was this, it was very short clips. I can't contextualize anything. I don't, I don't know what to make of it. Um, but Robert, so the people say, how, you know, how can there be Nazis in Ukraine Zelensky's Jewish. I, I mean, as if as if that's as if that's an argument to say like, I mean, that's not an argument anyhow. That's just identity politics, but in reverse. But the the flip side argument, people can call it a Putin talking point, but you can also analogize it to, I don't know. I guess the, the KKK's use for the Democratic Party, other way, other other, the, you know, America funding Bin Laden to fight the Russians before he became the enemy. The argument would be that. They have a use because they're like the dirty cop on the team that will do the things that the good cops won't do. And Zelensky was using them to do that to suppress the 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 independence movement in the eastern region of the Donbass and Donetsk as of 2014. Is that is that the argument? Yeah, and I would say it's the Kiev regime uh, because Zelensky is purely an, an actor to talk in front of cameras. Now, of course, this week there were people who were suspicious because uh, he, the green he screen. Supported- Yes. I mean, it started off with there had been rumors that he wasn't in in Kiev anymore, wasn't in Ukraine anymore for a couple of weeks. But then he met with some EU people uh, and they supposedly came in uh, and were guaranteed safe travel, safe transit. But there are issues that they photographed. Somebody put out photographs of the train station and somebody noted that doesn't appear to be any train station in Ukraine. It appears to be a train station in Europe and Poland in particular. That was the first flag. It was a little odd that EU people were going to travel to Kiev through Russian controlled territory in the middle of a war, particularly if you believe, as these EU people claim, that, you know, Russia is evil. They're killing random people. They just want to just be torturous. You know, they're the next Hitler. Everybody's the next Hitler, of course. Uh, The and so uh, because you can't use any other war script, you're stuck with the World War Two script, Uh, the great freedom tunes, uh, uh, YouTube uh, video that did that mocked this very, very effectively. The, the, all the different wars that have been sold as fighting the new Hitler, uh, Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Sudan, Somalia. You think it might get them, you know, it's more like World War I and every other dumb war. But the, uh, that was the first concern. But then the second was uh, he appeared, uh, in, 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 he's trying to look like he's walking through the streets of Ukraine in front of a big building in Kiev. And people looking at it were like, that looks like a green screen. And the first time I heard about it was from the Duran, uh, from uh, Alex. He said, this this kind of looks like a green screen. And then I, I I was getting bombarded with people that are, you know, your true autist types uh, who, uh, you know, who figured these little kind of details out. And they're like, this is clearly a green screen. And then so then the concerns rose as to is, is he really there? What, what's happening? Is he? But I've never I, I agree with Colonel McGregor's analysis. Again, he was a top Trump ally and uh, uh, advisor. And he uh, he was the kind of person Trump should have promoted even more. Uh, he actually tried to. But deep state apparatus blocked it at various levels. The uh, he said that uh, uh, Zelensky's just a puppet. Uh, you know, the guy was an actor his whole life until he became president. I mean, this is not like a Ronald Reagan who's active in politics and is an elected governor and is involved in national politics for more than a decade before he becomes president. This is a guy who was literally it's like if you woke up tomorrow and Alec Baldwin was the president of the United States. That's what Zelensky is like. So I don't I think he just reads off a script uh, in between uh, some other well, habits so he has. You know, 
I, I watched Coach Red Pill. I, I'm only citing Coach Red Pill. There, uh, this is funny, by the way. The same people saying, how could there be Yahtzees in Ukraine if Zelensky's Jewish? Or the same people who claim Trump was a Yahtzee, even though his, da his daughter-in-law and grandchildren were Jewish. Very funny. Um, Ghost Crusaders. Her son-in-law. Son-in-law. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. It was the daughter. No, it's his daughter married. The yeah, okay, okay, fine. Uh, Jared. Kushner. Kushner. Um, Robert, so I, I've heard these same rumors that and this will bring us maybe into the Hunter Biden story, unless we have more on the Ukraine. It, it, it'll merge. It'll, it'll, mer yeah, it'll there's, marry. There's two other parts of that that are totally collateral that are interesting about what's happening right now, so, legally. The, the, the one, one theory is that it's, it's funny that, you know, there was a hacked laptop that was passed off as being Russian disinformation by the 50 top intelligence spies or whomever in the United States. Turns out to be true. And there might be rumors as to what Hunter Biden might have been doing in the Ukraine to earn his $50,000 a month from Burisma and whether or not he and Zelensky have similar life habits that might make them, you know, I don't know, weekend type friends. Robert, do you want to um, finish that sentence from there? Sure. So, I mean, the I mean, it's not a coincidence that the people that led Spygate, Russiagate and Ukrainegate are all deeply, deeply connected to the effort to provoke and instigate and promote a war in Ukraine. Uh, they saw correctly, Trump is the biggest hurdle to that occurring and remove Trump and you remove that from, from occurring, even though, and had they not done any of those things, likely this war never happens uh, because Trump had a very different direction, saw NATO as mostly a useless entity that should be you know, dialed down rather than dialed up said so publicly in the campaign of 2016, said, really, we should get rid of NATO or at least get out of it. The uh, And recognize, and said we should make an ally of Russia, not an adversary. It makes no sense in the modern age, given our real geopolitical adversary is China, economically, politically, culturally, and otherwise. And so the, uh, but of course, you know, that, that, that ship has now sailed with what's happening. But the, uh, so the, it's not a coincidence there are deep ties and deep connections. In fact, you go deeper, you look at the oligarchs that are were backing Zelensky that funded the whole. I mean, it was really. A, I mean, it's a brilliant kind of thing. And it was, you're an oligarch. You start a TV station. You start a TV, TV network. You create a script for a young actor to pretend he's president for five years. Then you set him up to be president. You know, I mean, it's it's you, you it's when people said that you know Ben Kingsley's character in that one movie or Wag the Dog could you know that was just unrealistic. Mm. Uh, this suggests that they actually understated the absurdity of, of aspects of the world we live in. Robert, I'm going to interrupt you. This let's just uh, everyone dial in Scott Adams right now. Loser think. Uh, just I'm, I'm going to break this one down. Red coat leader. I hate to pick on you, but you brought it on yourself. This is dry and disappointing stuff from Barnes. Dry, disappointing, judgmental, ad hominem, bordering on attempting to shame literally ticking off every single Putin talking point. That itself is a talking point. Specific uh, response would be would be better than this. Literally ticking, and it's also just saying, I don't even have to address it. It's all garbage. So straw man. A healthy distrust of the mainstream Western narrative shouldn't mean shilling for the Kremlin. Robert, may I ask you a personal question? Do you receive funds from the Kremlin? <laughs> <laughs> no, the uh, I mean, it's 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 extraordinary. The for all those people, your shills for George Soros, your shills for Hillary Clinton, your shills for the State Department, your shills for Klaus Schwab, but you know the your shills for the World Economic Foundation. They so might. If, be, if I think there's a stronger game, argument. You can call me a shill for Putin. Which side would you rather be on, Putin or George Soros or Klaus Schwab or Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden? These are uh, you're on the wrong side. Almost everybody who could whose side you don't want to be on in this conflict is on the side of promoting this war in Ukraine. But Robert, I, want to say the, I think there's, there is a stronger argument to say that those making those type of type of comments are shilling for mainstream media and all of the wonderful people you've just described than there is for you to say, I have a healthy distrust and I'm going to apply that distrust with, 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 with logical reason thought. So it is, I had to bring up, thank you for the super chat. Uh, I, if you have a specific point that you'd like to address, put a smaller super chat next time or even just a comment and we'll get to it. But that was nothing but loser think ad hominem straw man it's, personal attack with nothing of substance. Yeah, it's 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 a sign of the uh, 
the situation. Yeah, I have seen those videos. Now, there's a mixture of that. It's hard to get full context, of course, yes, for what's happening. But there's even worse videos out there. And the, the, some of that is there was a apparently a rash of crime that took place in Kiev, especially after they gave guns to everybody. Um, and so the that there may be some aspects of that or they these may be aspects of just I mean, what was unleashed with the Maidan coup in 2014 almost guaranteed this day would come that be that you they unleashed the most hardcore, dangerous elements. And, you know, you would think our intelligence apparatus in the West would have learned. But, you know, I mean, we promoted the Muslim Brotherhood for crying out loud. I mean, during the whole, uh, you know, Arab Spring, we were unleashing the Muslim Brotherhood on the Arab world. We were pretending that wasn't the case uh, until they literally took over in Egypt uh, and brutally, I mean, during one of the protests, brutally assaulted a CBS reporter. The uh, So it's, uh, but, but you're going to get this. If you disagree with the institutional narrative, you must side with the enemy. That That's sort of the, the proposition or side with whom, who's, whoever's identified now as the enemy. The, I, I, I mean, uh, but for, that, for that's, the, that's usually a sign of bad logic, not a sign of good argument. No, it's, it, it's straight to shame and it's straight to shame and ad hominem. With, with this, no, nothing is substance. One point, one point. The, 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 someone had said that your, your defense of the Wagner or your defense, your explanation on the Wagner group was not a, a non-answer because they're funded by the government. Therefore, Putin is funding... Yahtzees in, in Wagner. Um, I mean, merc we use mercenary groups all the time, too. A lot of people do. So you can argue about that mercenary group, whether we should have mercenary groups, so on and so forth. But the uh, we don't necessarily take responsibility for some of the actions of our own, um, uh, unfortunately. But And I think there's risks in, in using it. The argument, Trump actually uh, considered replacing all the U.S. troops in Afghanistan with just mercenaries because the argument is you, you have distant responsibility and things of that nature. But there's, there's at the whole, that argument's a whole nother argument, the utility of mercenaries, the historic use of them, the ways it can backfire, the ways it can be beneficial. But speaking of uh, mercenaries in arms, one of the interesting things that's happening is there's now reports coming out, which should be no surprise to anybody that a lot of the arms that we're shipping over to Ukraine are actually that the arms dealers, illegal arms dealers of the world are lining up for a shopping auction. Because, I mean, if you're a major defense manufacturer, you can't sell directly to a bunch of regimes and corrupt and, you know, cartels, for example, can't sell to them directly, can't do these kind of things. Uh, so how do you get your weapons into their hands? Various insurgents, you know, maybe the Ethiopian civil war that's ongoing, the Yemen war that's ongoing. You know, how, how do you get your weapons there? Well, you get the government to do it for you by using a corrupt middleman. So the government buys your weapons. The government sends it to a country rife with corruption who just lines up some of these weapon systems they can't even use. That's usually the giveaway, by the way. This is an inside deal for arms dealers, sending weapons that are unlikely to actually be used in the conflict, in that particular conflict, or for that particular country. And that has happened in this case. And now apparently arms dealers are lining up. And basically taxpayers are helping fund arms dealers for, uh, for illegal arms users around the globe. Uh, is kind of what's going on. But that's because of the extension to which Ukraine has always been a grift. Uh, the International Criminal Court, or Court of the, not the International Criminal Court, but the International Court of the United Nations, International Court of Justice, uh, issued a rule uh, order condemning Russia. But the International Court of Justice has no jurisdiction unless both parties consent. Russia didn't consent. So it was kind of a, a, a uh, another you know, useless kind of ruling legally. But speaking of grifts, uh, you know, th those are the main legal aspects of what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. The, oh, uh, hold on. The Before you get that, remember, bookmark it, Robert. I got to bring up another one. I'm going to channel Scott Adams again. Robert, I understand your skepticism about what's coming out of Ukraine, but why do you believe everything the Russians say? Does anyone of the 17 plus thousand people watching here now had gotten the impression that Robert believes everything the Russians say. I, so again, this is like, okay, I understand the skepticism. Now let me go and mischaracterize your entire position by saying something you did. Okay, uh, so we don't even yeah. need to address it. But Robert, I also thought the incubator story was false and not the real reason we went into the war. Didn't mean I sided with, you know, I was for Saddam Hussein. The, you, uh, you, Robert, uh, you're a Saddam Hussein apologist. I know you. I, it's it's oh, terrible. I, you should be ashamed. I've experienced this my whole life from the time I was a kid. So I'm not. Uh, these arguments are not uh, are not new to me. So the uh, it, but it's a sign of what is striking is it's a. I remember talking with Bernard Shaw of CNN uh, a few years after the first uh, debacle 
of the Iraqi war and the recognition that CNN made a bunch of the incubator story being most prominent, but there are other complete lies and fabrications they preached to get us into that war. And, and Shaw recognized, he said, the media really failed and we're going to really work hard to make sure that doesn't happen again. I, I don't know if there's ever a war where the media has been skeptical, at least initially at certain points because of the draft, I believe, the Vietnam War, as Russell Brand uh, recently noted, the uh, the Vietnam War became something that some members of the media questioned and critiqued. But for the most part, we have been, uh, um, and this is true of all medias. So the you know you you get the different perspectives of you know what's on the media in Russia, what's on the media in China, what's on the media in India, what's on the media in Brazil. Though apparently you can't use Telegram now because the a a, a judge in Brazil who's anti Bolsonaro. Uh, it has shut down Telegram from being used in, and it's just a coincidence, by the way, that Bolsonaro is uh, heavily uses Telegram to get his message out. We're, we're going to get there. We're going to get there in a bit. Yeah. Um, so it's just one of the examples. So, but this is pretty commonplace. Uh, people should uh, apply their independent understanding of history and analysis and evidence and facts. Use common sense. Uh, the Duran did a good breakdown, uh, or Alexander, who has his own channel as well. I won't try to pronounce his last name because I'll butcher it. The, uh, but the, uh, that's how you know both of them are originally Greeks. They're both named Alexander. <laughs> that's, a, that's a little giveaway. The, uh, but he uh, broke down that the how to spot a false flag. And I'll do a, a breakdown of that for a future hush hush at vivabarneslaw.locals.com. But look at things like means, look at things like motivation. Uh, you know, even Trump kind of got taken in on the chemical weapons, the second magical chemical Syria. weapons attack in Syria later proven to be false by all Aaron Mate and others that did great research on it. So, uh, but it's tough during a time of war to get honest information from a, uh, and it shows you how corrupt our institutional media is and how thoughtless so many thought leaders are in the American West that you, you should be hearing a robust debate. You should be hearing all the different sides, all the different angles. You're only hearing one and it's extraordinary. And people believe things that some of the things, I mean, there's still people who believe the ghost of Kiev is still shooting down planes. They think Sam Hyde is flying those planes and taking down those rescues. I mean, it's it's sad, but it's uh, uh, a long reflection of a long history. Well, actually, this will be the good, I mean, but there's so many things where this segues into a various bunch of directions, but separate segue. Uh, in Ukraine now, Zelensky, uh, I would say, exploiting or employing the Emergencies Act declaration is now locking up journalists or or arresting of vloggers, um, and what, what unifying unifying the media because apparently in times of war the message has to be consistent, which to me basically sounds like nationalizing the media to promote prop you know state run propaganda. I don't care what country it's in. I don't care what the context is. That's what's going on, uh, and and you have people on social media saying. Well, of course, it's normal. They're in a time of war. You don't want people losing faith. You don't want people. Uh, you don't want people getting scared by reality. You don't want people knowing the truth because if they knew the truth, maybe they would shift their loyalties or maybe they would second guess their loyalties. What? Well, maybe they wouldn't be, you know, volunteering for service and then meeting a Russian missile the next day, like some of these, you know, kids running off to war. Uh, a lot of these lies are dangerous lies. As a lot of people from the realpolitik school, people who don't have a bone in the fight politically between Russia and the West, uh, who say that you know these things are going to be counterproductive, that uh, they're going to lead to more unnecessary deaths, uh, what's taking place, and and Zelensky doesn't help this by you know he goes and does his very I mean shocking, you know we're, we're, it's it's like a parody on a parody. The he does a speech that if you look at the video presentation, it's almost verbatim the visual background of from the movie George Orwell's 1984, where you have your two minutes of hate. And it's just like, I, when I first saw it, I was like, that can't be right. Somebody must be playing around. And I think it was like, oh my, that's exactly right. So you got that kind of insanity going on and people who seem to think 1984 is a good script. It's what happens when you have lazy screenwriters. It's what Critical Drinker talks about in his, he goes, why is film so down? It's not just woke politics. It's bad screenwriting. These people look just crimp from other books and movies and say, well, let's do this. But it didn't help him that he, you know, he compares himself to Martin Luther King, compares uh, Ukraine to 9-11, the, uh, uh, and then told the Israelis today that it's just like the Holocaust. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, this is not helping, but it, it gives a sense of where the world is at and how media works. And they expect to fool you like they fooled you so many times before. But what was interesting, a Canadian poll, they polled people who are 
triple vaxxed uh, versus the people who had chosen not to get vaccinated. And you can see that the people who chose not to get vaccinated are an independent minded group, period. And uh, particularly they didn't get triple vaxxed. And what in that group said, we should not be involved. And then this was, you know, of Canadians should should not be involved. The triple vax are like more, war, more, war. So it tells you, you know, who's who's an NPC and who's for real. I'm 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 you all know my status. I'm proud to say I'm not triple vaxxed. <laughs> never, never will be. I think I've learned. I I I now I have I have regrets. I've had a few to 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 quote quote Sinatra. Sinatra. How much does all this trigger any like paranoia i mean all this more evidence coming out about side effects and things like that yeah i, I look I, I'm, I'm glad i didn't i'm glad i made certain decisions in the negative i you know i'll, I'll risk <sighs> when they say robert what did they say they said um oh that that doctor who put out a video on twitter i've skydived i've fed a cheetah i went hiking a volcano at night I'm going to wear a mask. It's like, you idiot. You're like, yeah, okay. You, so you have bad judgment. You've done dumb things and you don't have, you don't know how to rationalize danger. And you think this is a good argument. You've done drugs. Sarah Silverman said, come on, you know, you've done drugs at a party. You've taken whatever drugs and you didn't know where they came from. You can get the facts. That's the wrong argument. Liz, look, I'm alive. Poo poo. Touch, touch glass. Um, I won't do it again. I mean, this is, the, but the problem is now, it's made me skeptical on other stuff, which I assumed was settled science because the, the damage that the medical and scientific community has done to themselves, it might be irreparable in my lifetime. I will always be a, I will always be a skeptic now. But Robert, hold on a second. There was one thing I wanted to say here. Do I, oh, I, it's, the, the, the chat may be too far gone. It was another good one. It was another good one. Hold on. Cernovich is hoaxed. Is a good, definitely worth a watch. Definitely worth watching. Yeah, it was and at the premiere of that in uh, in in Hollywood. This was okay. This was definitely not the the chat that I wanted. But here we go. Here we go. Rob Russia. Rob, by the way, Rob, because nobody's ever referred to as Rob on this channel. But this is that's indication number one. Scott Adams, Rob, demeaning or uh, an attempt to power play. Don't know why you're carrying Kremlin's water. Again. It's all. <sighs> Unless yeah, I mean the it, yeah, it, it's if that's your response. That means you don't have an informed, intelligent analysis, which you should ask yourself why. The uh, everybody at some point in their lives has been the victim of propaganda. The uh, we've just gone through it in massive doses in the last five years. You know the propaganda over Russia Gate in the first place, uh, the pro the the propaganda against Trump in general, which is often way over the top. Uh, but especially, you know, we've had three in three years propaganda over COVID and everything related to it. And look who ended up right and who ended up wrong. Did the institutional narrative end up right? Did a lot of these people that were quiet early on turned up right? The uh, Or did the people who were critics from day one turn out right? Then we had the election fortification in which the institutional narrative, the greatest and safest election in history. Who, who told you the truth and who didn't about that? And can you trust the same people about a war in Ukraine when the same Peter Stroke, the same key people that sponsored Russiagate, Spygate, and Ukraine Gate are deeply involved and embedded. And that does transition into the New York Post having to admit that the, I'm sorry, the New York Times having to admit that the, all those spies, the same people telling you, you have to go into war, the same people you're relying upon for information and intel about what's happening and what the causes of this war are and where it's going are the same people who signed that letter that told you Hunter Biden's laptop was just Russian disinformation. Okay. So good, anybody good. who believed in Hunter Biden's laptop was just speaking and shilling for the Kremlin. Oh, yeah, no, they you, you, out, you right? were a Russian apologist. You were a Trump, yeah. you were a Trump uh, you know, talking points.